Now we've just done it. We have just finished the, the discussion on abrogation. So the question you have to ask yourself is, can we establish that there's a concept in Islamic law called abrogation? Well, we have at least gone and showed that there is a reasonable basis for Muslims to believe there is, because we have shown that there are publications out there that purport to be authoritative, that we can show we can get in many mosque associated bookstores that say that. That's a leading indicator that it is probably true. Okay? But even if it's not, I hate to sound like I'm being smart here, but I don't mean it that way, we could still, pro we could still show that information is out there and that these radical groups believe it is true and orient their whole strategic line of thinking to that end. If you want to know how it is you could predict a rear square months ahead of time, you would have to understand that abrogation and the milestones process that rides on top of it is locked in tight. Okay, It means you have to make a decision to exclude other things from your analytical processes that interfere with it. If you do that, if you decide when you have uh, Rommel's plan for the battle that despite the fact that you like Napoleonic warfare, you want to read Napoleon's plans understanding Rommel, and you keep having really nice you know, articles about Napoleon, but you cast aside Rommel's battle plan and you lost the battle, you see the point I'm get getting at here. When you know there are analytical processes that they use, that they adhere to, that they're faithful to, and we have certainly demonstrated that. We certainly demonstrated that is it with Syed Qutb's milestones. We shown pretty faithful following of it by the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. We show that the Muslim Brotherhood in America used that narrative. So really, I have to ask the question, why aren't you looking at this? Because this versus everything else is like one times zero. Okay? This has answered questions. I have been able to brief and people who have adopted this process have been able to brief with precise protective information. The best success I've ever had with this, so let me just finish. Either this concept of abrogation is valid and requires analytical processes in the decision making process as part of doctoral template analysis, or it doesn't. But if you're going to exclude this, ask yourself on what basis you're going to do it. And if the only thing coming out of your mouth is that you rely on subject matter experts, then what we really need to do the next time there's oversight hearings is ask the, the, uh, the subject matter experts you relied on what their concept of the war is because they're the ones fighting it. Okay? I would like to point out that after I demobilized in 2004, I went back to my private sector job and it was the, the J2 at the Joint Staff that asked me to come in and brief them 18 months later. And I decided when I d went to go brief them that I would put down, it was the first time in my slide, the question, is there a point where your outsourcing of an understanding of things leads to your or outsourcing of the decisions on them? That's when they decided they asked me to come on board. I didn't ask for a job. I wasn't politicking for a job. They called me in. And I came in and I started working for the Joint Staff on that basis. The basis that I was already saying, you're outsourcing that which you have a lawful duty to know yourself. Okay? So for people who think this is an outrageous argument that I'm springing on people, there's never been a time I've not argued this point. And people who know me know that's true. Okay? So what I'd like to do is give you an example of how this, because I could give you many examples, the Major Hassan and abrogation being a key one, I give you four more right off the top of my head. What I want to do is go into the timeline brief. As circumstances would have it, uh, in May 2010, some members of Congress, if I would brief them on what uh, Secretary Napolitano and what um, Director Mueller was, Mueller was calling uh, lone, wolf, lone wolf terrorism, the lone wolf syndrome. And so I came in and gave them a brief. And what I did was I showed that this concept of lone wolf m mapped one for one with, with what Islamic law calls the lone, the individual jihad. More importantly, it was the first, it, was, it overlapped with the first time Al Qaeda came up with their magazine, Inspire, where they had announced one, a change in strategy, and two, a requirement that everybody else get on board. I only bring this up because what happened is over a period of time, I just started watching events unfold. And by the time October 2010 came up and Body, Body had changed the more or less posture of the Muslim Brotherhood to one that was very much more offensive than it had been up to that time, we realized that Al-Qaeda's requirement 
where they were saying that they were going to war was matched by the Muslim Brotherhood's answering that call in October. And we were with great precision able to tell people, watch out, watch out, the, Muslim, the, the Middle East may be coming down. By December 2010, we were doing it in earnest. In the first week of, uh, the first week of uh, January 2011, when Al-Azhar came out and allowed one of its fatwas to be published by Islam Online, a Muslim Brotherhood web presence owned by uh, the chief jurist of the Muslim Brotherhood, Sheikh Yusuf Kawadari, validating a jihadi understanding of defense of jihad, we said, game on. The radical, the, 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 the jihadi, the dawah, and the mainstream voices of the Islamic world were converging on a point. Said it. Entire thing coming down. In fact, the very next day I was at the Washington field office and I briefed it. Okay? We have been able to show with great precision what was going to happen. We have not had to take back any slides since then. We, I would say we're close to 95% accurate. Now here's the thing. We were talking about what to look for and what to happen in December. So we were able to brief there is no Arab Spring. There's just what you want to see. Were there people in Tahrir Square calling for Arab Spring? Yes, there were. Were some of them true Democrats? Yes, they were. Did the Muslim Brotherhood understand that that's what you wanted to see? Yes, it was. Could that be why they would tolerate them? Of course it would be. Okay? The thing about it is looking at what's causing the currents underneath the run. And those currents were way ahead of events. So if you take a look at the Cold War, we talk about the use of the word indicators. We have indicators of future events, leading events, an indicator that something will happen. In this war on terror, I'm sad to say, but it's really going to be a war of lagging indicators. But at least it's an indicator that when something happens, the train may have left the station, but it's still validating a path line. Okay? So that, so that why the time to rear square happened, we know that certain decision points had already been reached to put them there. Okay? It's not like in the Cold War where something pops up and we can watch the timeline progress. It's that something pops up here with the Muslim Brotherhood and we know for them to do that, all these things had to be in place. So what am I saying? When Tahrir Square happened, the Muslim Brotherhood assessed they already had control of the, the, the levers of power. So at least in their calculation, they were going to be able to control the entire course of events. That's what we briefed then. That's what I say now. Okay, so here's the timeline. We haven't kept it current because I think it played itself out. I mean, I don't want to, this is not a full-time job, but 2010, Al-Qaeda announces a new strategy, and they told Muslim Brotherhood to get with the program. In October 2010, the Muslim Brotherhood Supreme Guide changes the direction for MB to be more directly confrontational. January 2011, Al-Azhar publishes an offensive jihad fatwa published by Islam Online. February 2011, the fall of the Mubarak government, similar destabilization across the entire Middle East. An MB Muslim Brotherhood victory parade in Cairo, 18 February 2011. 21 February, the Muslim Brotherhood creates the Freedom and Justice Party. That's just kind of like Muhammad El Abieri's Freedom and Justice Foundation down in Texas. Do you see the relationship? Freedom and justice. For those who are wondering, Freedom from the laws of man, justice according to Islamic law. And nothing else, really. And Kawadari called for the killing of Gaddafi. It's very interesting that our language going into Libya was somewhat parallel to the language the Muslim Brotherhood came out with with Kawadari. National Security Advisor meets uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood in March. The Muslim Brotherhood in Libya in, in 25 March, and Al-Qaeda in Libya with Iraqi combat experience, 28 March. Uh, the brothers, Muslim Brothers testify on human rights abuse in Syria. Okay? When the Muslim Brotherhood test, talks about rights, this is part of a different brief, and I'm not going to take too long here. For the Muslim Brotherhood, rights are defined as Sharia law. Different brief, we'll cover that. So, what do we have here? Let's take a look. Here, i just like to show you where you can get some of this stuff. Drudge. Islam rising. And I'd like to point out to you is the public, which has a very different view to what our senior elites do, then watches the senior elites talk down on them for what they're clearly seeing. Have you ever seen it? It would be a news program. And it will go something like this. When we used to have the suicide bombers 
in numbers. I, just, I would just remark on it. Half the story would be about how somebody blew themselves up. But the, the second half of the story, where everybody understood what it was, and what would they show? They would show the guy blew himself up. They would show that he was treated as a martyr in his community, even people clapping. You can even see wall art, mural art, celebrating it. That would be the first half of the story. What would the second half of the story be? It would either be one of their senior reporters or a reporter interviewing a senior U.S. decision maker telling you that what you just saw wasn't true. How many times do you think the American public who knows what they saw and hears that rationale, how many times do you think they have to hear that before they realize you're either trying to pull something over on them or you really believe that? Okay, I say this because, what was it, 65% of the American public has come out and made some, you know, expressed its views on, on, on various issues, which I think I might not necessarily agree with everything they say, but I think they show that they have a concern that's completely absent in our national security community. And I have a problem when, the, when we could show that the American public is on one side of an equation and their elites, their betters, are on the other side. So, Islam rising. That was 23 October 2011 when the meltdown began. Things are starting to head south in Egypt. So, what I want to do here, Afghanistan to back to Pakistanis, the Pakistan, back Pakistan if, if there's a war, I'm sorry, Afghanistan to back Pakistan if wars with the U.S. That's, that's their bad writing, I guess. The car's eye. Just trying to kind of jump into it. Here we have an article here, and we're going to go into the timeline. We're not going to go to uh, October. We're going to jump into it in February. We'll move forward a little, then we'll go to the beginning of the timeline. Okay? What does it say here? Brotherhood spiritual leader preaches in Tahrir Square. Well, they're talking about Yusuf Kawadari. Yusuf Kawadari, because we, we, we define Islam strictly in religious terms and leave out the fact that it also defines itself as a legal system, we seem not to get a handle on the fact that he is also the chief jurist and a part of the world where Islamic law is understood and explicitly stated to be the law of the land. I always have to make it clear, explicitly stated to be the law of the land so that when you decide not to look at it, there is a huge element of denial. Denial of facts that otherwise can't be controverted. Okay. And then the whole creation of an artifice to talk about events in the absence of facts that otherwise cannot be denied. And thinking that is as valid as the real thing. Okay, so I got to tell you, Kawadari did not go to Tahrir Square and have his victory parade because he was a spiritual leader, just a spiritual leader. Where do we get this? All Arabia. And what's the story about? It's about the fact that, um, let's see, he was banned in Egypt for 30 years. He's the uh, pro Yusuf Kawadari, scholar, imam. Okay, military forces accompanied him everywhere he went. You bet they accompanied him when he went into Egypt. But they had to let him in. Okay, now if you take a look at Tahrir Square footage when they had the protest, 100, 200,000 people showed up. But if you take a look at the footage, when Yusuf Kawadari showed up for his victory parade, meaning showed up and gave the first Juma prayers after the fall of Mubarak, the first Friday prayers after Mubarak left, what was it? Two, two and a half million people showed up. Steve, it's a total coincidence that the head of the Muslim Brotherhood would show up and have two and a half million people show up and it being a Muslim Brotherhood operation, like you're alleging. Those two don't necessarily correlate. Of course they don't. Right. Okay, so what do we have here? Kawadari last delivered a Friday prayer sermon in Egypt in 1981 after the assassination of Anwar Sadat, at which point he had to leave. Some of Kawadari's sons and daughters took part in Tahrir Square. This is very important because here we have Islam Online, the Arabic edition, and they're showing some stuff. And here we have Islam Online, the English edition, and the, all the talking is about the Muslim Brotherhood running Egypt. It's all over the place. So, this is an in-your-face Muslim Brotherhood victory parade. And still we have people say, you can't, you can't say that. Oh, Steve, there are many versions of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
oh, and there are secular versions of the Muslim Brotherhood. You can't equate one member of the branch of the Muslim Brotherhood with the others. And now, I think the FBI is saying, you can't, you can't associate a, Muslim brother, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood with the doctrine they're sworn to enforce. I mean, that's kind of the same as saying you can't hold a U.S. military officer to the oath he took to the Constitution. I mean, my gosh, of course you can hold them accountable, members of the Muslim Brotherhood, for their membership there, and you can hold them accountable for the doctrines they're sworn to. Why would you think anything else? So, here we have it. Who is Yusuf Kawadari? Founder of Islam Online, supports Hamas. He has not been allowed in the United States since the Clinton administration. So he's kind of a universal, not too well uh, thought of person. But you know what? He, he graduated from Al-Azhar, so you might think many bad things about him. But the fact that he's a second tier imam, that's not one of them. He's world class, and he's recognized in the Muslim world as world class. So here's, let's take a look at some of his fatwas. In September 2004, all the Americans in Iraq are combatants, and there is no difference between civilians and soldiers. Killing Americans in Iraq is an obligation. As far as I know, this has not changed, okay? Despite the fact that I hear that we're using him as a mediator between us and the Taliban. If you think about it, the Muslim Brotherhood says it's a part of the Islamic movement, a term the FBI banned. And the Taliban says it's a member of the Islamic movement, capital I, capital M. So it would actually like having, asking the quarterback of the other team to coordinate with the running back negotiations with us if we're on the defense. Think about that. And how you can keep from understanding that? Outlaw the language they use to, de to define themselves. So, we do not associate Islam for war. Religion must lead to war. So, we know who these guys are. They publish fatwas. When I mean they publish them, they blast them to the whole Muslim world. So, let's take a look. Please take a look at this date right here. February 2010. One whole year be before Tahrir Square. And what's this about? Ellie Bieri running for president. Why do I think this is interesting? Because here's this guy. He runs, he runs Al Baradai for president's web, website and Facebook group. His name is Abdel Rahman Yusuf. And I thought, Abdel Rahman Yusuf. That sounds familiar. Because isn't it Abdel, Abdel Rahman Yusuf Al Kawadari? And by, by George, it is. This would be the son of Yusuf Kawadari. Okay? Now the thing is, my assessment said that means Baradai is somewhat under the control of the Muslim Brotherhood. Everybody tells me, oh, no, 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 he's the moderate, he's the liberal, and I go and say, right. Okay? So, and there it is, it basically identifies him as, a, as that. Here we take a look, this is, uh, I do believe it's July, uh, July mid-July, last summer, 2011. And did you notice all about the same time, all of these articles about the rifts inside the Muslim Brotherhood? The same Muslim Brotherhood everybody was working hard to say was not taking over Egypt. Everyone was reporting was in a state of disarray. And I had to point out that they weren't in a state of disarray. That was all for your consumption. And here's the thing. I was briefing it then, okay? Then I was saying, don't worry about that. That's all I wash. Are there things going on? Sure there are. Okay, so what did this article say? I'm going to cut a uh, quick uh, cut to the uh, chase here. It basically says the risks highlight Egypt's growing political free for all. Uh, the Brotherhood has also axed its ties to Abdal Monim Abu Al Futa, a 59 year old former member of the group's exclusive leadership council. You know, the Muslim Brotherhood, you could say, is kind of like the mafia. Once you're a made person, you're never not, you might be retired. Once you get to a certain level in the Brotherhood, you're always a member. It's just silly to think that it's not. So, I mean, if a made man in the Mafia said he retired, you would think many things. He could be just an old guy and he's moved on. But you will never think he's an old guy who's no longer affiliated. So, what do we have here? Here's the New York Times. What's the date here? I want you to get used to this. June 19th, right around the same time. And what is it saying? It says, Egypt's election is supposed to divisions in the Muslim Brotherhood. Do you see the talking point campaign here for the Western media that so badly wants a free election? To the Brotherhood, Futa says, I am more liberal. 
Okay? Sympathetic Islamists and liberals call him Egypt's answer to Turkey's uh, Erewhon. He calls for tolerance and pluralism. I said, no. You see, if you keep reading that article, you'll see that he's a Muslim brother. But here's the other thing. Let me see if I caught this in the last one. Okay. Oh, I think we get to it later. What we see here is um, right here, when you get to the bottom of this long, long, dreadful article, Futa led a faction of Brotherhood members who, de who denounced the platform, enlisting rulings from prominent Muslim scholars like Sheikh Yusuf al Kawadari. So here's the thing. You're a brother, and you live in New York, and you're not totally, ch and you're not totally keeping track of everything, and you want the rundown. So you see that article about all this stuff, and you follows Yusuf Kawadari's thought was, got it, move on, got it. I want to make this clear. Do you understand? Got it. Okay? We know now that that's all eyewash. Okay? Because he's Kawadari. Doesn't get better than that. So, focus on securing individual rights and liberty. It basically says a pattern emerges. Muhammad Baradai, leading liberal guy. So, then we go and we say the Brotherhood really won its first legislative battle out of 18 million Egyptians who voted in March's constitutional referendum. A landslide, 77% voted not to change the Constitution's second article, subordination to Sharia. So what does that mean? 90 per, if you take out the 12 or 15% of the Coptic population, it's 90% of the Muslims in Egypt called for the very Sharia that Al-Qaeda has committed and the Muslim Brotherhood has committed to implement. So, I had someone tell me about when questioned about the Afghan and Iraqi constitution, they, they talked to a senior military person in, in, in Afghanistan. And when first confronted about why they let the language in the constitution, they first said it wasn't in the constitution. And then when they had to be shown that it was in the constitution, they said, well, the goal was to have good Sharia to be implemented as opposed to bad Sharia. Think about that four-star person talking like good Sharia and bad Sharia. I tried to ask the member if they'd followed up by asking, well, what's the difference? Can you expound on your understanding of Islamic law? Just so you could see them kind of, you know, wander off. Good Sharia, bad Sharia. So, here we have it. Let's bring this full circle. Remember this? Support I support the candidacy of our brother Abdul Munam Abu Al Futa. You see this? And who said this? Chief you, uh, Sheikh Yusuf Al Kawadari. When, in the same article who, where he said, "We will not be chopping off hands for the first five years," why? They know as they're taking power that there are just too many Muslims who are nominal who don't quite understand Islamic law, and it wouldn't be totally fair to punish them too inhumanely because they have to know what the penalty is but the other reason is they don't want to be weighed down by Western concerns for human rights as they need your money to pay for pay for their food so they know exactly the game to play and they're telling you right there you see this it only makes sense according to the laws of progressive revelation the rules of abrogation as understood in the milestones so what does the what do uh, peace and the limits of war say while the Muslim Ummah is obliged to uphold the principle of jihad and satisfy its requirements, the method of honoring this principle is a question of strategy, not tactics. I mean, not, not belief. There is not this huge, huge difference of view between the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Al-Qaeda, and the Muslim Brotherhood in terms of their understanding of Islam. There's only an argument about timing and tactics. So, it's called managing a narrative. But I thought CARE was just a civil rights group. So here we have an article talking about a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. The interviewer, a guy named Totten, asked the question, why aren't you down in Tahrir Square? This is July 2011. The country is demonstrating against the regime except the Muslim Brotherhood. Arane says, we were in Tahrir Square. And then the guy goes on and says, uh, I mean in general. They don't feel like you're on their side. Arane said, when the history of this revolution is written, everything will be clear. 
we are not going to say anything about our role in the revolution. Let the others say what they want. I mean, really. I think this is one of those things, all points down the line, they're always going to have an article that kind of winks at you and says, this is the real game, guys. It will never be said that we didn't tell you what we were doing. We just convinced you that it wasn't what we just, we just say it. We just convince you not to listen. These aren't the droids you're looking for. So here we have another example of articles on Muslim Brotherhood website to implement Shari in phases that was coming out in Egypt in, in uh, 2011, January 2011. Here we have the Sunni cleric, Kaudari, the army should kill Qaddafi. What is he saying? This is February 21st. Sheikh Yusuf Kawadari issued a fatwa on Monday that all Libyan soldiers who can shoot dead and battle leader Muammar Gaddafi should do so to rid him of Libya. This is the Muslim Brotherhood declaring war on Gaddafi. Okay, he's declaring war on them. What is he basically saying? By saying that he is subject to being shot and killed, he is no longer a Muslim. Um, he's a Muslim without right. You can kill him. He doesn't qualify on the killing without right status. Okay? Whoever in Libya in the Libyan army is able to shoot a bullet at Mr. Gaddafi should do so. Not to obey orders to strike at your own people. He said, do not strike at your own people. You see this? That would be the killing without right. So basically, he's saying you can go after Gaddafi, and Gaddafi soldiers who fight back are killing without right. That is clearly taking a position. Okay? The killing without right. Okay, we'll be done. So it goes on and says that Egypt's, uh, the cleric, spiritual leader of Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood and longtime resident of Gutter, has the International Union for Muslim Scholars. The International Union for Muslim Scholars is therefore a Muslim Brotherhood entity. And hence necessarily Muslim Brotherhood led. For example, what do I have here? Center for Islamic Legislation, Ethical Thought, launched a gutter. And who is it? Let's be quick here. Uh, the director is Tariq Ramadan, grandson of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Aouda, and some other people. The center is based in, uh, in gutter, uh, in gutter uh, faculty of Islamic stu uh, studies, a member of the gutter foundation. So, see how easy it is to pull this stuff up? Al-Qaeda announces a strategic shift. Now we're going to the very beginning of the timeline. Okay, this is July. There is Inspire Magazine. Inspire Magazine comes out as their first edition, and what does it say? First we see there's a change in scope for Al-Qaeda, because this is Al-Qaeda's magazine, excuse me if I misspoke. Islamic Magazine is geared towards making the Muslim a mujahid, a holy warrior, a jihadi, in Allah's path. Our intent is to give the most accurate presentation of Islam as followed by the Salaf al-Sali. No longer Wahhab, Wahhabi based, the entire Salaf al Sali. Our concern for the Ummah is worldwide. Uh, jihad has been deconstructed in our age and thus its revival and in, in comprehension endeavor is of utmost importance for the Caliphate's manifestation. This is a change in scope. Wahhab was never mentioned. So we take a look at Al Sori in his article. Our secret organizations, watch this term, secret organization. It's a term of art. Our secret organization, it, it looks generic. Our secret organizations were militarily defeated in all the confrontations. Yet we, yes, we won many of the battles, but we lost the war in all jihadi experiences and confrontations. So we have to change with the times. He's arguing for a change in strategy. And what does he do? He says the school of secret military organizations is out. And he, had, he heads up a discussion the School of Open Fronts and o Overt Confrontation, and the School of Individual Jihad and Small Cell Terrorism. What you're going to see is they still trained for stellar, these spectacular events, but that's been de-emphasized. They're going to go for small jihad and individual jihad. By the way, lone wolf terrorism actually is an individual jihad. as recognized. It's recognized as a doctrinal form of jihad going back to Muhammad. Here's the last fatwa from a sitting caliph written in the, uh, World War I by the Ottoman uh, Caliphate. What does it say? Forms of jihad. Jihad may be of three forms, individual jihad, and it consists of the individual personal deed, and it may be by the use of cutting, killing instruments like 
the jihad of dot dot dot. The killing of one of the officials arriving from Mecca by Abu, S Abu Basir in the age of the Prophet is an example. When the Prophet com uh, commanded Abdullah, the son of Attic, that he and his four companions should go and kill Abi Rafi, the chief of the Jews of Kaibor, well known for his enmity to Islam. So what is, what is the, caliph, the caliphate saying? The individual jihad, really, or small unit jihad, reaches all the way back to, to Muhammad inst instituting them back in the time of Muhammad. So, then there's jihad by bands. It may be described as a jihad by bands known in our time as brigands, as in brigandage. And it is enough for you that the prophet began the jihad by bands when permission was given to him for killing. The formation of bands in our time is of different kinds. And the most profitable of them during World War I is that which makes use of secret formations. And it is hoped that the Islamic world of today will profit greatly from secret bands. Remember, Al-Sori said, those are the ones that are no longer working. And these formations may take the oath of excess in which the prophet participated before sending out them out originally. So, the Muslim Brotherhood, so there we have this change of, this change of uh, scope for the Muslim Brotherhood. As the article went on, I think it was al Sori who said, I'm not quite sure here, I'm looking, nope, Ada. Some of them believe we are on the Meccan stage and have therefore set for themselves programs that are limited according to the rules of Mecca. In July 2010, we said, you see this? This is Al-Qaeda poking fun at the Muslim Brotherhood because Al-Qaeda is upping their ante in the Medinan phase for war, and they're telling the Muslim Brotherhood to get out of the Meccan stage and go to war. Okay? And we said, watch that. Okay? At the time, they were chiding Al-Qaeda for being weak-kneed. But do you see how this is all based on a common understanding of abrogation? That they all understand what that language means? So, what do we have here? When God restrained Muslims from jihad for a certain period, it was a question of strategy, not principle. And there are serious disagreements in question. In July 2010, take a look at this, you had Al-Qaeda and the Revolution Now stage, and you had uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in the Meccan stage. Let's just say the Jihad mission is like the Bolsheviks. Revolution now. Put your sword down. Don't hit, stop till you hit steel. Muslim Brotherhood was like the Mensheviks. Slow subversion over time. So that's where we were in July 2010. The gap was widening. And it's the concept of abrogation that defines what's going on here. So what do we have here? Because I'm going to speed by here. 2010. The Supreme Guide of the Muslim Brotherhood body replaces Akaf as Supreme Guide of the Muslim Brotherhood and announces a shift in the posture. Now, we have the actual translation, but I use the one they published in the English language version of Islam Online. Why? To show you that even in their watered down version, they're still giving you enough to know that there's a change because they have to declare. So, what do we have here? Here's the Muslim Brotherhood page. The chairman, remember his real title is Supreme Guide, but for Westerners, he's a chairman. Chairman changes, change and reform requires sacrifice. What is, sac what is the supreme sacrifice for a jihadi? Become martyred, okay? So what do we have here? Dr. Muhammad Badi called on the Muslim nation to unite against the enemies who are plotting against it. From the Islamic point of view, the relationship between the Muslim and non-Muslim countries should be balanced. And if Muslims faithfully implement the constitution of Allah, they will be victorious. And if they fail to do so, corruption and injustice would prevail against them. He pointed out that Muslims need to realize the means of power and understand that change and reform cannot be achieved without the ultimate sacrifice. What is the ultimate sacrifice for the Muslim Brotherhood? Jihad. That's in their motto. Martyrdom and Jihad. For Muslims, especially Sharia compliant Muslims with affinity for the Muslim Brotherhood, the ultimate sacrifice is that. So here we have, Badi concluded this message citing the Quranic verse which ascertained that believers will have victory on all future enemies. And here's the quote from Quran verse 54, 45. Allah said, the hosts will all be routed and will flee, will turn and flee. So this is, this is the throwdown. We were assessing that Badi was declaring war. But that means that ISNA and CARE and every other Muslim Brotherhood entity under its jurisdiction 
and all Muslim Brotherhood entities are under their jurisdiction, were in a state of hostility. So, Chairman changes, what do we have here? I would like to point something out. We could go all the way back to January 2010, okay? Look at this. The freedom narrative has been a narrative of the Muslim Brotherhood going all the way back. Freedom, don't think like a Westerner, an American. What does freedom mean for the Muslim Brotherhood? And what are they saying here? Freedom from the laws of man. Justice according to Islamic law. If we were threat focused, we'd have understood that that's the only thing it ever meant. And we would not be mirror imaging Western and American concepts of freedom and justice as the template on which to evaluate what they're doing.